You know, the early episodes of Season 2 of Twilight Zone were hitting it out of the park, and this episode was sandwiched in between The Howling Man, oh, the devil, and Nick of Time, which obviously Shatner was involved with. But the, uh, the, the idea of the episode uh, about um, basically conformity and racism in a future society has residents more now than ever before because of the political upheavals uh, across the world. So this episode of Twilight Zone, uh, uh, written by Serling, it's called I the Beholder, or in syndication, A Private World of Darkness because of the controversy over the title. Now, it was initially rebroadcast Summer 62 under Private World of Darkness title, and has uh, been there in syndication. Now, to uh, not to give too much away, there's a very, very big celebrity cameo at the end of the episode of an actress that you weren't, we weren't recognizing who she was at the time. Of course, it's Donna Douglas, the beautiful Ellie Mae from uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. Now, this was uh, episode 42 of TZ. It originally aired on November 11th, 1960, Remembrance Day, on CBS and, of course, in Canada and different countries across the world. Now, uh, Serling's narration of the opening gives the whole plot away suspended in time and space for a moment you're introduced to miss janet tyler who lives in a very private world of darkness a universe whose dimensions are size thickness length of the swath of bandages that cover her face in a moment we will go back into this room and also in a moment we will look under those bandages keeping in mind of course they were not to be surprised by what we see because this isn't just a hospital and this patient trio seven is not just a woman this happens to be the Twilight Zone, and Miss Janet Tyler, with you, is about to enter it. Now, uh, Tyler has undergone her 11 treatment, the maximum number legally out by the state in an attempt to look normal. Now, we don't know exactly what she looks like. Could she be crippled? Could she be, you know, disfigured? We don't know. Her head is completely bandaged, so her face is entirely covered, and her face is described as a pitiful, twisted lump of flesh by the nurses and doctors, lurking in the shadows of the darkened hospital room. The outcome of the procedure cannot be known until the bandages are removed. Unable to bear the bandages any longer, Janet pleads with the doctor and eventually convinces him to remove them early. As he repairs, the nurse says that she's still uneasy about Janet's appearance. The doctor becomes displeased and questions why Janet or anyone must be judged on her outer beauty. The nurse warns him not to continue in that vein as they consider it treason, so it gives a hint this is a future society similar to the Third Reich, so uh, something's going on here. When the doctor removes the bandages and announces that the procedure has failed, very dramatic scene, by the way, her face having undergone no change, and it's Donna Douglas, and at the time probably one of the most beautiful actresses, uh, up-and-coming actresses in Hollywood history. Janice revealed to be a beautiful woman by contemporary standards, while the hospital staff all possess monstrous faces, uh, pig-like with drooping features, large thick brows, sunken in eyes, swollen, twisted lips, and wrinkled noses with pig stout like nostrils. Now, the uh, makeup used for this is quite effective because everything is basically done to hide it, but when you see it, it makes a lot of sense. So the, the first 12 minutes of the episode hides it, but in the last 12, it you basically say, well, that makes a lot of sense. Now, distraught by the procedure's failure, Janet tries to escape on her, until a similarly attractive man named Walter Smith arrives to take her to the village of her own kind, where there will be no trouble to the state. As he does so, he assures us that while the state society finds her ugly, others will find her beautiful. Now, in the closing duration, not a question that come to mind. Where is this place and when is it? What kind of world where ugliness is the norm and beauty the deviation from that norm? You want an answer? The answer is it doesn't make any difference because the old saying happens to be true. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. In this year or a hundred years hence. On this planet or wherever there's human life, perhaps out amongst the stars, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Lesson to be learned in the Twilight Zone. Now, there's a very effective scene at the end of the episode where she's done a Douglas with only a pretty well, you know, a hospital nightshirt on or a nightgown. She's running uh, past uh, a, a monitor where one of the, the pig people is, is talking, you know, with Stalin esque style a single you know a single voice a single whatever it's pretty freaking scary very effective 
And Donna Douglas's character does a lot of method in this too, which is quite quite interesting. By the way, Maxine Stewart does a great job of Janet Taylor under the bandages, and of course Donna Douglas plays the Tyler character on Mass. Now William D. Gordon uh, plays Doctor Bernardi. Jennifer Howard as a nurse. Edson Stroll as Walter Smith. George Kemos as the leader. And Joanna Hayes as nurse number two. And of course, Kemos is making, you know, these break declarations. Now, because of the complex makeup and camera angles, it was one of the most difficult episodes of the Twilight Zone ever to film. The director, Douglas Hayes, wanted the show to feature actors with sympathetic voices. To achieve this, he cast the episode with his back to the performers. Hayes had a plan to hire Maxine Stewart, who spoke on the lines of the main character, Janet Tyler, when her head is entirely covered by bandages, dubbed a single line spoken by Tyler when she's revealed, as portrayed by the actress Donna Douglas. However, Douglas had been listening to Stewart's voice as she recorded her part, and was able to imitate her so successfully that she was allowed to speak the line on camera. Now, like I said, the original title of this episode was I, the Beholder. Stuart Reynolds, a TV producer, threatened to sue writer and producer Rod Serling for the use of the name. At the time, Reynolds was selling an educational film with the same name to public schools. Reruns following the initial broadcast featured the title screen as a pause screen, The Private World of Darkness. Because CBS consulted different prints over the years uh, for syndication packages, the closing credits for this episode vary from one title to the other, depending on which TV station is using which package. Now, we used to get uh, Twilight Zone on WDIV from Detroit. Uh, it's part of the N1 cable, and he showed that, uh, what do you call it, that one sheet. In the Twilight Zone's original DVD release, the syndicated version was marketed as an alternate version. Other than the appearance of the title in the closing credits, however, there are no differences between the two versions. Now, ironically, Rod Serling plagiarized the episode for a later teleplay to different ones, which is a terrible episode of the Night Gallery. The different ones takes place in a futuristic world, where a disfigured hermit teenage boy is sent on a NASA rocket to a planet where the inhabitants are revealed to look like him. During the transfer, he meets a conventionally handsome alien youth who is going to work because of his own disfigurement. And like I said, it's played mostly for, for laughs, but it, it's not effective at all because it's too much like the other one. Now, the episode was remade for the 2003 revival of series using Serling's original script, but discarding Bernard Herman's original score, with Molly Sims as Janet Tyler, Reggie Hayes as Dr. Bernardi, and Roger Cross as the leader. The makeup was changed to make the faces look more melted, ghoulish, and decayed with deep ridges. The remake follows the original script more faithfully. The projection screens were changed to plasma screens. The board of dialogue from the leader's monologue was used. Now, this is considered uh, probably a top five episode of Twilight Zone, and why it works in Mark Scott Zickery's uh, book, The Twilight Zone Companion, uh, talks about a little a little way. This was uh, an episode where all the effort was put in to make it as deceptive uh, at first, but uh, as shocking at the end. Because how Twilight Zone was was three things: there was fantasy elements, which this is this is the future. There's ho horrific elements, and basically the creeping tension. We really don't know why it would only uh, you only be limited to eleven surgeries. And what was the surgery trying to do? That's the only plot hole. When we see them as, as the pigs that they are, where they try to adding uh, pig features or scratching the skin, because Donna Douglas typically looks like a young ingenue. I think at the time she was no more than 23 or 24. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, he, she played a, a ditz. But we, when we were growing up, we saw Donna Douglas, we remember, for the Twilight Zone. So we ended up on... Uh, uh, Actually, she, sorry about that. I think she was 26 or 27. That's amazing. She looked about 18. Anyway, that's that's not the point. She died, uh, of course, in 2015. But uh, Douglas, that's pretty well the, the big role that she's most remembered for before uh, Twilight Zone. She had done uh, some television, but before, uh, like 1959 was the, uh, the big year for her. Now, the... Uh, the Donna Douglas oeuvre, as we say, she was basically what they call eye candy for certain game shows and programs in the late 50s. But like I said, uh, Douglas, uh, uh, there was, a, like I said, very strong method acting, especially when she she runs into her savior, the uh, the handsome man. 
there's a she gives a scream like she's she's so put upon and uh, there is a connection between uh, you know uh, Stewart acting and Donna Douglas because uh, Maxine had that kind of same personality uh, that uh, Do Donna Douglas had but uh, actually uh, Maxine uh, was a uh, Ironically, a life member of the actor studio, so she was doing uh, the method that maybe her and Donna Douglas had a little conversation, you know, uh, before it was going going on. Now, uh, the uh, what was a uh, kind of weird, ladies and gentlemen, she came to Major Promise again some thirty years later, when she was nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Guest Actress in a Comedy Series for the Wonder Years. So it's. Uh, Amazing, amazing career. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of I, the Beholder. Probably one of the most uh, dramatic and uh, memorable Twilight Zone episodes. But if you're going to watch it, uh, just remember, turn the lights on because it is pretty scary. And I don't know why they never showed it on Halloween uh, weekend, two weeks before, but maybe it wasn't ready. But it was. everybody was home that day because it was Remembrance Day in Canada and uh, Veterans Day or what, uh, Memorial Day in the States or whatever it's called back then. Um, amazing acting, amazing acting. But I tell you something back then, the special effects that Twilight Zone was doing was almost like uh, the quality of great B movies. So uh, my, my hat's off to the production company there and Bernard Horman's score. Again, tremendous. So I to Beholder, five stars out of five. Have a good one. Bye.